Let's look at Exodus 20, 16 again. This is the commandment. Let's read it together. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. Now, the, I think the key word there is false, right? This commandment really is about not telling the truth. In other words, it's about lying. Mom asked her little boy to tell her what a lie is. And he said, Mom, a lie is an abomination to the Lord, but a very present help in time of need. <laughs> well, it may seem like a present help, but I'll tell you right now, every lie will always come back to bite you. Every lie has a consequence. And you know, you look at our world today, man, and it seems like, and, and, I, and, I've, and I've said this several times, and I think that the, like, the spirit of deception has just been released upon our world, man. It's just crazy. I think it really came to light in 2020 during the whole COVID deal. And you start seeing how deception is just woven into everything that we come into contact with in life. You li we live in a world where truth isn't based on facts anymore. We live in a world where truth is based on feelings and based on what's good for you. It's all relative when it comes to truth in this world. And it seems like you can't turn on the TV without, without some kind of lie, whether it's explicit or implicit. You can't turn on the computer. You can't watch something without some lie being woven into the storyline, the plot, or whatever it is that you see there. You can't watch or listen to a political speech of anybody's without being peppered with lies or exaggerations to the point that you know it's not true. And the reason for this is very simple, just like we've seen every other commandment. The reason it is so prevalent is because it's a human problem. Every one of these guardrails we've been discussing, that all of these are a human problem that God wants to correct, that God wants to lead us in the right direction. It goes back to the fact that it's against our original design, the way God created us. And so every one of these guardrails, every one of these commandments deals with the human inclination that all of us are born with to go and step outside of God's original intent for us. It doesn't matter if it's sex or if it's hatred or murder or, or, or stealing or lying or coveting like we're going to look at next week. All of it goes back to sin entering this world and messing up what God originally intended. Jesus came so that we can go back to the original intention that God had for you and me. It's a, it's a sinful nature that we inherited from Adam. We are not born good, friends. We are born, we are born broken. And that's why God had to send his son to fix us. And so when we recognize that, we understand that, it's something that we have inherited from all the way back to Adam and Eve, right? And so we have, we're born with this propensity to lie, and we need God's guidance. We need God's word. We need his power. We need his spirit to go from this propensity to lie to a, to a default mode of truth-telling, of actually becoming truth-tellers, loving truth-tellers. I read some stats this past week that said 91% of Americans lie at least weekly. I'm not sure how accurate those stats are, but I'm sure that every one of us are very well acquainted with lying. If you have never told a lie, raise your hand. If you just raise your hand, you lied. Because we've all lied. All of us have. George Washington apparently was the only one that never told a lie, but I'm pretty sure that was a lie too. <laughs> right? And when you talk about lies, sometimes we think of just one type of, oh, this is a lie, but I want to I help you understand that this lies takes up all different kind of forms, right? So there's a straight up lie. Most of us recognize a straight up lie, and that's when you totally make something up to benefit yourself in some way. When I was in junior high, I was a black belt, I mean a, br a brown belt in judo. That was a lie. But I had watched all the Bruce Lee movies, so I knew I was a brown belt in judo. But some straight up lies are a lot, a lot more nefarious and a lot more wicked than making up that you're a brown belt as a kid. People lie to get revenge. 
They slander people. People will slander someone to get their job or to get their position. They lie about someone else to make themselves look better. And there's all kinds of motivation for the straight up lie. It could be motivated by jealousy, hurt, anger, hate, resentment, or just plain old insecurity. Can I just tell you that we battle insecurity and one of the ways that we help ourselves with insecurity is by lying. It's deception. Sometimes it's just self-promotion. Then there's the half-truth or the twisted truth. And that's when you say something that is technically true, but you clearly say it in a way to mislead, right? To deceive. Well, what I told you was true, but you said it in a way that was actually meant to deceive someone. I read about a guy in Bible school who named his bed the Word so that when people would ask him what he did all morning, he said, I was in the Word all morning. <laughs> Think about that. <laughs> so was, that's a good idea. No, it isn't. It's a lie. We also have the exaggerated truth or the stretched truth. We take a little nugget of truth, but then you stretch it and you exaggerate it to the point to make yourself look better, Right? And then there are the lies that we tell to avoid all kinds of confrontation. We tell lies to avoid awkward situations or for people to like us. We don't like for people not to like us. And so we'll make up lies or we will withhold the truth or we will stay silent and not tell the truth. And sometimes by not telling the truth, you're actually participating in a lie. And you also are a liar. Somebody starts gossiping to you, you know it's a sin. Not just for the gossiper, for the, but for the one who listens to it. And instead of stopping them and saying, no, I'm not going to participate in this, you stay silent and you listen. And by your silence, what you are saying, it's okay. There's absolutely nothing wrong with gossip. So in essence, you are lying by withholding the truth and you're doing it for selfish purposes. Because you don't want, you want people to like you or because, oh, you don't like confrontation. Whatever it is, it's a lie. And all of these types of lies, all of these things that we deal with as people are there. But I think, I believe, I think I know that the worst lie, the most damaging lie we can tell is the one that we tell ourselves. Self-deception is where the heart of this matter lies. If we cannot be truthful with ourselves, then we cannot be truthful with anything or anyone else. If we refuse to apply the truth to ourselves, friends, we'll never experience the, the life that God wants us to live. We'll never experience all that God desires for us. And friends, it happens in churches every Sunday, including this one. It's amazing to me how people can sit here week after week hear God's truth, and still go out there and do exactly what they were doing before they came in here. Because you would rather than acknowledging and applying the truth, they lie to themselves, and they tell themselves they're okay. This isn't for me, this is for someone else. Well, I want to make sure that so-and-so listens to this message. Oh, if only so-and-so were here today. Because I don't lie, I don't gossip, I never steal, I don't commit murder in my heart. I'm not sexually immoral. We love each other. I don't misuse God's name. I'm not an idolatry. None of this applies to me. And they keep living in sin, lying to themselves all the way to an eternity in hell. Too harsh? Not when it saves someone from the eternal fires of hell. You know what that's called? It's actually called love. When you tell the truth in love for the sake of someone's good. And here's the truth. When we don't want to face something painful, we lie to deny. Turn to somebody and say, we lie to deny. And again, you're saying, not me. No, yes, it's universal. Because deception is a human problem. And it's a human problem because it's a heart problem. Let me just say this, that the Bible very clearly says it's not so much a matter of the lips. 
is not so matter of ma- a, 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 much a matter of our actions. It's a matter of our hearts. You can try to stop things from the outside, but you'll never change unless you start changing in the inside. Jesus teaches us this very clearly in Matthew 15. The words you speak come from where, church? From the heart. They come from the heart. And he says that's actually what defiles you. They were talking about, you know, external things. Well, you eat the wrong things and you get all dirt. You, get a, you become unclean. You, you know, you can't go worship because you've done this. And he says, no, no, no. You want, you want me to tell you what makes you unclean? You want me to tell you what defiles you? It's what comes from your heart. He says, for, from the heart come evil what? Evil thoughts. We're going to look at those next week and coveting desires. Murder. We've covered that one. Adultery, we covered that one. Sexual immorality, covered that one. Theft, yep. Lying and slander. All the commandments are broken because of what comes out of our, of our hearts. And we're in this mess, let me just remind you again, because Eve was deceived by the serpent, the devil, who, by the way, is the father of, of not some lies, but of all lies. And then Adam followed suit. And when God confronted them with the truth, what did they do? They lied and denied. They, they shifted the blame from themselves to somebody else. You know what that's called? Self-deception. And so Adam blames Eve. And Eve blames the serpent. And the serpent didn't have a leg to stand on. So he's just like... And here's what I want you to know. That heart that they displayed when they were confronted by that truth, by the Lord himself, is the kind of heart that we're all born with. Jeremiah said it this way, the Lord, he quotes the Lord, he says, the heart is deceitful above all things, and what? It's incurable. Who can understand it, he says. But then he says, I, the Lord, search the heart and examine the mind or the thoughts, right? So here's a question for you. When our hearts are incurable, what do we need in order for us to keep living? We need a new heart. We need a heart transplant. I know people have gotten heart transplants because their hearts were broken beyond repair. And here's the deal. That's exactly what God gives us when we turn our lives over completely to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. If what is coming out of our hearts is still wickedness, if it's still evil, if all the things that Jesus said are still uh, operating in our lives, then we we don't have a new heart because the heart is deceitful. But if we want the outside to change, if we want our actions to change, we need a heart transplant. We need a new heart. And that is exactly what the Lord has promised to do to all who call upon his name. He said this in Ezekiel 36, I will give you, come on somebody, a new heart and I'll put a new spirit inside of you. I will remove from you your heart of stone that that the, the word bounces off of and it never penetrates and no matter what anybody says, it just bounces off and you blame shift and you do all this stuff. He says, I'll remove that heart of stone and I'll give you a heart of flesh. Where you can actually feel my conviction. Where you can actually know that I'm speaking to you. I'll change you. And he accomplishes that, guys. When we experience what Jesus described as being born again. A new spirit. A new creation. Here's why I bring this up. We are not capable of keeping this commandment or any other commandment by our own strength or willpower. In fact, that's one of the reasons that God gave the law, is to show human beings that they are incapable of keeping the law. So that when we got to the end of our ropes and said, God, I can't do this. I can't keep these laws. I can't keep your commandments. 
that we would turn to him and say, and he would say, I know. That's why I sent you my son. That's why he died in your place. So that when you trust in him, I can put a new heart in you. A new spirit that will empower you to actually live the life that I've called you to live. So when we get to the end of our rope and say, I can't do it in my own strength. I need yours. That's why he gave us the law. And by, by God's power, friends, we can live a truthful life. By God's power, we can live a life where deception is not part of our lives. We can live a life that is a life of truth, but we need a new heart and we rely on God's power instead of our own. Because when Jesus saves us, what he does is this. He makes us a new creation. He takes us back to the beginning where God created us in his image before sin entered and it was marred and we were destroyed and we were messed up. Now we are born again and he recreates us in the image of Jesus, in the son's image. Paul says it very clearly in 2 Corinthians, therefore if anyone is in Christ, he is what? A new creation, not a reformation, not somebody who's been reformed. No, it's a brand new type of creature. It is a brand new kind of creation that is different from the rest of creation. So as followers of Jesus, we are new types of human beings created in the image of Jesus. He says the old has passed away, the old heart has passed away, the old desires have passed away, all of that has passed away, and the new has already come. So if you've surrendered to the Lord Jesus Christ today, if you're here today and say, I, I gave my life to Jesus, I love the Lord, I, 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 wanna, I wanna live in him. You have been born again, you are a new creation, you are a new person who you have been recreated in Christ Jesus, but here's the deal, you progressively grow into his image. When we pray before we, before we read the, after we read the word, before we get into the, the message, we always pray, God, make us more like Jesus. If you ever hear me pray on Wednesday nights, the Lord, let us leave here more like Jesus than when we came in. Because that is what God is intended for us as followers of Christ. If I say I'm a follower of Jesus, but I am never becoming like Jesus, there, I need a new heart. I need a new heart. But if I have a new heart, guess what? I will progressively become like Jesus. Now, turn to somebody and say, it's progressive. It's a process. So don't expect someone who gave their life to Christ last week to all of a sudden just become like Jesus today. It's progressive. Now here's what you do. You look and say, am I progressing? Am I becoming more like Jesus? And as a result of his word, as a result of what we go, get into, we become more and more like him. And here's the deal. If we're becoming more like him, Jesus is the very personification of truth. He said, I am the, the way, the truth, and the life. John 1 says that he is full of grace and truth. He is the personification of truth. And if we're becoming like him, then to lie and to live a deception, a deceitful life is to be the opposite of Jesus. In fact, it's not just being the opposite of Jesus. Can I just, can I just drop something on you this morning? When we live lies... When we live by lies and we deceive all the time, not only are we not like Jesus, we actually, we are actually not like Jesus. We actually are becoming like the devil. We are the devil. To lie is to be like the devil. When the religious leaders of his day rejected him because he is truth. When the religious leaders of the day rejected Jesus because he spoke the truth in love, grace and truth, and he always operated in that way. But they rejected it because they were self-deceived. They had hearts of stones. And this is what the Lord said to them. You belong to your father, the devil. Now we're too nice today to say that to anybody. But Jesus loved them enough to tell them the truth. He said, you, you, you reject me and my truth because you belong to your father, the devil. And you want to carry out your father's what? desires look what he says he was a murderer from the beginning what notice he ties murdering with with lies with deceit he was a murderer from the beginning not holding to the truth for there is 
no truth in him. Not even a fraction. There is no truth in him. He says when he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father, the creator, the originator of some lies? Of all lies. He's the father of all lies. I want you to notice his ultimate desire. Jesus said he's a murderer. So his ultimate desire is murder. That's his, his end game. So when he lies, his goal is destruction. His goal is to bring death. Every time a lie is dropped, depending on the, on the, on the, the size of the lie, the reason for the lie, but there, something dies. The end result is going to be destruction. And what the devil does, he's a murderer. Jesus says he's a murderer, but he uses deception as his tool to bring about that murder, to bring about that destruction. So here's what I want you to see. Lying is destructive to both the deceiver and the deceived. Can we say that together? Lying is destructive to both the deceiver and the deceived. Lying destroys relationships. Lying destroys trust, which is what all relationship is built on. It destroys institutions. It destroys societies eventually. Deception is destructive. Deception is destructive. I want you to remember that. Turn to somebody and tell them, deception is destructive. And that is why God says, don't do it. Don't do it. See, he is truth and he's not touched by our lies. We are. We're the ones that are impacted by deception. And friends, if you make a list of the verses where God talks about lying and how he feels about it, it's astonishing. Let me just give you a few. Psalm 5. You will destroy, God, you will destroy those who, what? Who tell lies. The Lord detests, what? Murderers and deceivers. Notice how those two come together. Murderers and deceivers. He's a murderer from the beginning. He doesn't tell the truth. He's a liar. God says, I detest murderers and deceivers. We think murder is a lot worse. God says, mm, I'm going to show you this in the next one. Proverbs 6. L look at this. I want you to see this. There are six things that the Lord hates. Let me stop for a second. Say, I didn't know God hated. Yes, he does. But what does he hate? He hates the things that, that bring destruction to our lives. He hates the things that hurt us. He doesn't hate it because of himself. He hates them because of you and me. He wants the best for you. He says there are six things the Lord hates. Seven, there are what? An abomination to him. Look, he lays them out. Haughty eyes, that's pride. What's the next one? A lying tongue. Then he goes on to murder. Hands that shed innocent blood. A heart that devises wicked plans. Feet that make haste to run to evil. A what? False witness who what? So that's two. He, he hates a lying tongue. It's an abomination to him. And then he adds it again. So he talks about lies twice. He talks about deception twice. Those that run to evil. Those that run to Walmart so they can find who they can gossip to. They run to evil. And then the one who what? Sows discord among his brethren. You know what God hates? You know what's an abomination to him? When people speak about and against their brothers and sisters in the Lord. When people bring division and try to bring division in the church. Notice this. He could have picked a whole bunch of things. He said six, seven. Seven that are an abomination to me. I hate it. It's detestable. It makes me sick is what the Lord is saying. 
And he includes lying or deception in both of those. Isn't that crazy? How does he really feel? Tell me how you really feel about this, Lord. Proverbs 12, 2, the Lord detests lying lips, but he delights in those who tell the truth. So we can either be detestable or delightful to the Lord. Right? Revelation 20. Let's go to, look at 15, Psalm 15. Who may worship you in your sanctuary, Lord? Who may enter your presence on your holy hill? Those who lead blameless lives. They live above reproach. They, they live in a way that people can't pick out stuff to blame them for. And they do what is right. Look what it says. What's the next one? Speaking the truth from what? Hearts. Sincere hearts. What's the last one there? He says, you want to come before me with clean hearts? You want to be able to enter my presence and, and me acknowledge your worship? And this is who you're supposed to be. If you're gossiping and speaking ill of each other and, and, you're, and you're being wicked, then listen, that's, I, I, I can't stand that. It's detestable to me, he says. And you get to the end of the book and it says, you know, it talks about the righteous being rewarded in the presence of God forever and ever. But he says, but as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for what? Murders? Yeah, that's bad. The sexually immoral? Yeah, that's, yeah, we can see that. Sorcerers, yeah, witches, yeah, for sure. Idolaters, yeah, people that worship idols and don't put God first, absolutely. And all what? What about those people? Their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. The next chapter, very end of the book, outside, outside the gates of heaven, outside the holy city, are the dogs, those who practice magic arts, the sexually immoral, that's the adulterer, that's the, the one who, sec, who, who commits sex outside of the marriage of one man and one woman for life. That falls into that category. Listen to the last, the second to the last message that we preach. The murderers, the idolaters, and what's the last one? Everyone who loves and practices, practices. That's consistent falsehood, one way or another. If you want to see how God feels about lying, read Acts chapter 5. And this married couple named Ananias and Sapphira, who said that they gave more than they actually did. And the Bible says they lied to the Holy Spirit. You know what happened to each one individually? Each of them dropped dead. Right there. The, uh, we were, the ushers had to go and drag them out of church. Imagine if that happened today. Yeah, that's my 10%. Oh, that's only 4%. <laughs> Boom! <laughs> Say it with me. Deception, Deception is destructive. Is destructive. That's what God says. And that's why he says, don't do it. Don't do it. Just turn to somebody and say, just don't do it. Now, let's look at commandment today. Let's, let's go ahead and move forward here. I want, I, wanted you to see, I want you to see that this is not just, some, well, you know, what's, a, what's wrong with a little lying here and there? I want you to know what God thinks about this. He is truth. He is truth. Exodus 20, 16. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. Now, notice it doesn't just say, don't give false testimony. He doesn't just say you shall not lie. He says don't give false testimony against your neighbor. Why? Because lying isn't done in a vacuum. The commandment here explicitly states that it is lying against your neighbor. Against your neighbor. This commandment is doing this. It's focusing on distorting the truth in a way that actually harms somebody else. That harms your neighbor. Right? Right? That lie can end up destroying your neighbor. Now, this isn't a court case, but the principle lies the same. If you're in a court case and you lie against somebody and they get the death penalty, you just kill them with your, with your lie. And so what he is saying here is don't bear false testimony against your neighbor. But the, the principle is you, when you lie, you're hurting somebody else. And don't do it. The point is this. 
It's not just stop lying. It's not just stop lying. The point is, like we've seen with all these commandments, there's a positive to it. The positive is, is that we live our lives to promote the love of truth and the love of our neighbor, and we use our words to do this. So in everything that we do, the, the idea here is live your life in such a way that you uphold and, and you show that you love truth. You hate evil and you hate lies. You love truth and you love the people around you. You love your neighbor. It's about using the power of your words to promote truth and to promote your neighbor, not to tear down your neighbor or to lie. Does that make sense? So here's where we're going with the rest of this message. If you are a new creation in Christ Jesus, if you have experienced the heart transplant that only Dr. Jesus can do, then you have been freed from the slavery of deception. I'm going to say that again. If you have received that new heart from the Lord by being born again, you have not will be, but you have been completely set free from the deception, from the lies of the enemy. You're free. And I'm not just saying this. Jesus said it. Deception is a slavery. Deception will put you in bondage. If you're a follower of Christ, you've been set free from that bondage. John 8. Jesus said to the people who what? So he's talking to believers in him, not the unsaved. The unsaved have no power, but the believers in Christ do. And he's saying to the believers, you are truly my disciples if you call yourself one. I just wanted to see if you guys were reading along or just you turning your head there, but you're really thinking about breakfast or something. <laughs> you are truly my disciples if you remain faithful to, to the word of God. And if you remain faithful to the word of God, he says, you will know the truth. You're going to know it. What truth? Truth of his word, the truth of his teachings. And that truth will what? Set you free. Look at verse 34. I tell you the truth. Everyone who sins is a slave of sin. Stop there for a second. People think, I don't want these guidelines. I don't want people to tell me what to do. I know what I need to do. I know what I want to do. I'll just do what I want to do. That's freedom. The world says that's freedom. God says, no, that's slavery. Because anyone who sins, anyone who goes outside of these guardrails is a slave of that sin. He says a slave is not a permanent member of the family, family of God. But a son is part of the family forever. And then he says, because I'm the son, I have authority. Because I am part of the family forever, for all eternity, I have this authority. And in my authority as the Son, he says, if the Son sets you free, you are what? So go back to the, the previous slide. He said, you will know the truth. If you remain faithful in my teachings, you will know the truth. And the truth will what? Set you free. Is that true? Does he have the authority to say that? Yes, because you go to the other one and if the Son sets you free, you are truly free. So if you're a follower of Jesus, turn to somebody next to you and say, I'm free. Because that's what God says you are. That means that you don't have to lie. You don't have to bow down to any of these sins anymore. We are no longer people enslaved by deceit. Friends, we are now people who have been set free by God's truth unto God's truth. That's freedom that God has declared over every one of us. Now what we need to do is walk in that freedom, right? If you were in a jail cell, cell and somebody unlocked that door and you were in the cell and they said you're free, when will you become free? When you walk out of that cell. There are people today that are followers of Jesus and God has opened the door and said you're free and they're still sitting in the cell. So here's the deal. You've been set free. Turn to somebody and say, let's start walking in freedom. And I believe that by the power and the grace of the Holy Spirit, we can walk in Christ's freedom 
by committing ourselves to two things. Two things. Fight and affirm. Fight and affirm. We, we fight lies and we affirm truth. We fight lies and we affirm truth. Why? Because here's why we have to fight. Our old nature's tendency is to deceive. So we need to guard against that nature. We need to guard and fight against that tendency. Just because you're born again and you have a new nature doesn't mean your old nature has gone away. It's still there. And so we've got to recognize it and fight against it and, and be on guard against it, right? But that's not enough. We must affirm God's word. How do we affirm God's word? By consistently and continually affirming that word by our words and our deeds, by our speech and our actions. So it's not enough for me to say, I'm not going to ever lie. I've got to tell the truth. It's not enough for me to say, I'm not going to live in, de in deception. I have to live in truth. And so we fight and affirm. So let's look at the first one, fight lies. Fight lies, okay? Here's a few ways that we can fight lies. Everyone knows this. Everyone knows that fighting involves both defensive and offensive measures. All fighting involves defensive and offensive measures. When it comes to spiritual warfare of any kind, the Bible clearly states that the first thing we need to do is guard against all kinds of evil. We must be on guard at all times. We must be continually aware of the danger and guard against it and then respond with God's truth, right? Here's why I have to say this. Because if you think you have no problem whatsoever with this or any other kind of sin, you will never be on guard. And what you are definitely doing is just simply doing is you are assuring your defeat. The Apostle Paul writes to believers in Christ about this. And he's saying, listen, don't rely on your own self-confidence. Don't rely on your own thinking and your own wisdom because you'll end up deceiving yourselves. Look what he says in 1 Corinthians 3. He says, guard against what? Each of you. Each of you. Not some of you, he says. Each of you, all of you. Guard against self-deception. If someone among you thinks he is wise in this age, let him become foolish so that he can become wise. He says, stop thinking in your own mindset. Stop, stop using worldly wisdom. No, no, no. Understand you've got to guard against self-deception deception, and you do it with God's wisdom, not your own, right? He says this in, in, in 1 Thessalonians 5. He says, so be on your guard. Be on your guard. Not asleep like the others. Stop, wait, the person that's sleeping up next to you and say, listen, pay attention to this, this Bible verse right here. Don't be asleep like the others. He says, stay alert and what? Be clear-headed. And we can all talk about stuff that doesn't make us clear-headed. It makes us the opposite, right? He says, be clear-headed at all times. That's the only way you can be on guard. He says, not only do we fight against in internal deception, he says, listen, you've got to fight against this internal deception, but here's what we can do. We can fight against external deception. Yes. Peter deals with this. He says, there's all kinds of deception out there. First of all, make sure you're not being self-deceived. But then make sure they're not being deceived by somebody else. Look what he says in 2 Peter. So here are my final words, my friends. These are the last words he's going to share with them in, this, in this, his two epistles. Now that I have warned you about what's ahead, the day that's coming, day of the Lord is coming, judgment's coming, keep up your guard and don't let what? Unprincipled people pull you away from the sure ground of the truth. How do they do it? With their lies and misunderstanding what does that say? Oh, well, I'm a believer in Christ. I can't be deceived. Yes, you can. He's writing to believers and says, oh, you're on the sure foundation of the truth. Be careful. Be on guard. That's people that are unprincipled. That means they can say that they're one thing, but they live their lives as unprincipled. They can pull you away from the sure foundation of the truth of God's word. And will, they will do it through lies and misunderstandings, deceptions. So with that in mind, let me give you three ways we can fight against deception. Here's the first one. By regulating our tongue. Everybody say that. By regulating our tongue. The Bible teaches us about the power of our words. Look what James said about the tongue. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. The tongue also is a fire, a world of evil, among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body, sets the whole course of one's life on fire, and is itself set on fire by hell. 
It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. I wish James would just be more positive in his preaching. (laughs) I want you to make me feel good, James. What's up with all the hell stuff and your fire and the... Listen, guys, what he's saying is pay attention. The tongue is not just the most destructive, it is also the most influential part of your life. And he says it compares, he compares it to fire. Now we all know that fire can be used for good or bad. But a fire that is out of control is always wrong. It's always destructive. It's always murderous. And he says that's what your tongue can be if you don't control it. The book of Proverbs says a lot about our tongue. It's a book of wisdom. Let me just share a few verses from this great book. Proverbs 18. What you say can preserve life or what? Or destroy it. So you must accept the consequences of your words. There are going to be consequences to your words. The question is, are they going to be good or bad? Consequences. Proverbs 13 says, those who guard their lips do what? They preserve their lives. But those who speak rashly will come to ruin. Think before you speak. Proverbs 21, those who guard their mouth and their tongues, they regulate their tongues, keep themselves from what? The opposite is, if we guard our our tongues, if we guard our mouths and we regulate our tongues, then, then we will have blessing and not calamity, life and not death, right? Here's what I want you to see. Words are powerful. Whoever came up with that whole saying, you know, sticks and stones will break my bones, but words will never hurt. Liar. <laughs> Just by your own statement, you're lying. How many have ever been hurt by words? And let me tell you something. The wounds that come from hurt take much longer to heal than the wounds that come from a stick or something else. And so words are powerful. They have the power of good and evil in our tongues, he says. And that's why he tells us in James 1.19, and I'm going to read verse 26 as well. He says, understand this, my dear brothers and sisters. You must all be quick to listen. Slow to speak. How many of us live opposite to that? Slow to listen, but quick to speak. He says, no, no, be quick to listen, but slow to speak. Think before you speak, and slow to get angry. Look at verse 26. If you claim to be a member of First Assembly, but don't control your tongue, you are fooling yourself, and your membership is worthless. Here's another way we can fight the tendency to lie, by remembering the consequences. I I, I put some out for you so you can understand this. Listen, guys, sometimes we just have to stop and say, okay, if I say this, what are the consequences going to be? If I do this, who am I going to hurt? If if I go forward with this, how is this going to affect me and those around me? We need to remember the consequences of our actions. We need to remember the consequences of our words. It's essential that we recognize within this message the consequences of lying. Even at its very surface, even at the most superficial level, lying always creates all kinds of problems. We start with a little lie, and then we have to move another lie to cover that one, and then another one to cover that one, and another one to cover that one. And then before you know it, you've got to remember all the lies you told. And when you told them, Mark Twain said the difference between a person who tells the truth and the one who tells a lie is that the liar's got to have a better memory. That's so true. Of course, the more lies we tell, the greater the reality that all of it's going to come crashing down on us. And friends, it brings all kinds of pain and destruction. Proverbs 10 says that deceit causes trouble and foolish talk will bring you to ruin. What did James say? He says it corrupts the whole body, sets the whole course of one's life on fire, and is itself set on fire by hell. Destruction, I'm going to say it again, destruction, deception is destructive to both the deceiver and the deceived. And that's why God says, what? Don't do it. Don't do it. It will have an impact on the person lying. It's not just the people we lie to, but on ourselves. If, If we're lying... Here's what it'll do to you. It'll begin to deteriorate your sense of identity. It will begin to distort your perception of reality. Have you ever watched 
like on news, and we have these talking heads who are spewing lies left and right. And you're thinking, you're looking and you're thinking, how can they possibly be saying this? There is no inflation. What? I bought a bag of groceries and I paid $100. What? But they will say it. And they mean it. And they believe it. Because that lying over and over begins to distort their perception of reality. And it really, they, we call it gaslighting. They call it truth. And here's what a, 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 another thing it'll do. You, if, you're, if you're constantly lying, if you are led by deception, you, you will begin to project your dishonesty on other people. And this is what will happen. You will begin to think that everyone else is as dishonest as you are. If you're a gossiper, you'll think everybody else is a gossiper. If you're a thief, you'll think, you know what? They might be stealing from me. You will begin to think that others are what you are. That's what it does to you. And again, self-deception, it, it comes with a whole bunch of consequences. And the consequences are not just those that we experience in this world. But they're also going to be experienced in the world to come. Listen to the words of Jesus. I tell you that on the day of judgment, people will have to give an account. If I were to pick a verse that I can pull out of the Bible and say, uh, that one doesn't count. Let me, let me pull that one out of there. It'd be this one. Because I think of the careless words that I have said. And he says, you will have to give an account for every careless word that you have spoken he says by your words you will be acquitted and by your words you will be condemned so the first way we start with deception fighting deception is just regulate our tongues just keep keep our tongues under control of the spirit remember the consequences do i want to be judged by this one day and then here's the third one by refusing to gossip. And I, and I bring this one because this is big in the church. By refusing to gossip. Come on, say, say it with me. By refusing to gossip. Turn to somebody and say, this isn't gossip, but I, I need to tell you, we need to refuse to gossip. <laughs> Someone said that gossip is when you hear something you like about someone you don't. <laughs> and here's the deal. It, it violates the ninth commandment because the words are usually negative to our neighbor, doing harm to our neighbor, right? And sometimes, and most of the time, it's untrue. It's an exaggeration or a rumor. They have no reality that it's true or not. But really, it doesn't even come down to whether it's true or not. We don't gossip because of whether it's accurate. We don't gossip because of that. We gossip because it makes us feel better about ourselves. Proverbs captures this perfectly. He says, gossip is so tasty. How we love to swallow it. The CEV puts it this way. There is nothing so delicious as the taste of gossip. It's like M&M's. It melts in your mouth, <laughs> not in your hands. Right? Now, I, listen, you're sitting there and you think, yeah, I can think of so-and-so. They're such a gossiper. Of course, none of us here ourselves are gossips ever. No one here today ever gossips, right? No, no, we just want to be kept well-informed so that we know what's going on, right? Or, or, or we want to be able to, we want people to tell us how we can pray for somebody else, right? Isn't that the way we do it in church? Oh, listen, I just have to share that. Listen, I'm not... You know I love this person. Bless their heart. But I need you to pray for so-and-so because tell me more, tell me more, you know? <laughs> but here's the deal. Gossip is hurtful. Go gossip is damaging. Gossip is the opposite of loving your neighbor. In fact, when we truly love someone, and, uh, and most of us have experienced this, when we have to say something negative about someone, somebody that we love, it actually hurts us to do that. 
When we can say something negative about somebody else and not hurt us and actually delight in it, that's gossip. We're not loving our neighbor. And the problem is that it's so easy to do. It is so easy to do. When we speak rashly and we speak, uh, we repeat what we hear. Listen, it's much easier to say something than it is to do something. Here's something else, though, we need to keep in mind. It's much easier to undo something than to unsay something. Once those words come out of your mouth, they're irretrievable. There's a story told of a man during the Middle Ages who confessed to a monk that he had sinned because he had been spreading rumors and gossiping about certain people in the village. The man wanted to know how he could make amends. What can I do? And the monk instructed him to go and put a feather on every doorstep of every house in the community because the entire community had been affected. So the man hurried off. He fulfilled his penance as quickly as possible and he returned to the monk. And when he got back, the monk looked at him and said, now, here's the second part of your instructions. Now go back and pick up every feather that you placed on those doorsteps. And the man couldn't believe it. Sir, that, that, that's impossible. It's an impossible task. By now, the wind has blown those weathers, those feathers rather, around all of the village and even beyond the village. How can you tell me to go back and pick up every one of those feathers? And the wise monk told him, so it is with your careless words. They're like the feathers scattered in the wind. And once laid at the doorstep of someone's life, you can never retrieve them. And with that, the man left with a broken heart and committed to keeping a guard on his mouth. And friends, that's not just true of rumors and gossip. It's true of all words. So we fight. Come on, we need to fight. Everybody say, we fight. fight. We regulate our tongue. We remember the consequences. We refuse to gossip. Let me conclude very quickly how to affirm truth. Let me give you three ways to affirm truth. Really? It's not enough just to lie, not to lie, not to gossip, not to hurt others. We need to continually and consistently affirm truth of God's word. We need to stand up for truth. We need to speak the truth in love, right? We're made in the image of God. He is truth. And as his representatives, we need to love and live truth. Here are three ways we can do that. Number one, receive truth humbly. Receive truth. When it's presented to you, take it in. Don't get defensive. Don't push it out. Don't shift it to somebody else. Don't say that has nothing to do with me. The only way that we can deal with self-deception is to openly and courageously receive God's truth when it is presented. Of course, we need the Holy Spirit's help. We can't do it on our own. We read earlier that our heart is deceitful. We need the new heart and we need the Holy Spirit to help us. We need to pray as David did. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. Point out anything in me that offends you and lead me along the path of what? Everlasting life. So every time the truth confronts you, receive it and respond accordingly. Respond with confession. Respond with repentance, correction. When needed, respond with restitution and reconciliation. Secondly, keep truth consistently. Say that with me. Keep truth consistently. Live out God's truth. Friends, we are made to be men and women of God's word. And God wants us to be men and women of our word. Keep your word. Be true to your word. Listen, the people of the truth are people of their word. We live in a society that our word doesn't mean anything. I mean, people make billions of dollars every year throughout the world because they have to have contracts because they can't take somebody's word for it, right? There's lawsuits happening all the time. Listen, Psalm 15 describes the faithful worshipers as ones who keep their promises when? Even when it hurts. Even when it hurts, you keep your promise. And Jesus taught his followers that we need to be followers of, that we need to be people of our word, that we need to keep our word. He said, listen, don't, don't be swearing oaths. Don't swear by God's temple. Don't swear by this. What he is saying is, listen, if you have to say to people, no, I swear to God I'll be there. I'll swear my mother's grave. If you use any of that, what you're saying is you don't trust my word. If somebody says, uh, if you say, I'm going to be there, and they say, well, promise me you're going to be there. Swear to me that you're going to be there. That's telling me that they don't believe me. I have not kept my word to such an extent that I have to swear. 
Jesus says, as my followers, you don't need to do that. Instead, he says, let your yes mean yes and your no mean no. He says, Any mean, anything more than this is of what? Of the evil one, the liar. By the way, when you make a promise to somebody, listen to me, friends. If you say, I'm gonna be there, if you're gonna say, I'm gonna, I'm gonna help you, if you, anything of that sort, if you just something to do with them, especially with your children, if your parents, listen to me, please, let your children know that you're a, a man or a woman of the word. When you promise them something, listen, think carefully about what the cost is before you make that promise, not after. Don't make a promise and then start thinking, wait, I can't be there, wait, I can't. Now you have broken your word and what you do is you so suspicion and you create mistrust and there's hurt and there's pain so we 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 live and we keep truth consistently we receive truth humbly and then we tell truth lovingly turn to somebody say you need to tell the truth lovingly god wants us to grow up ephesians says be mature be more like jesus to know the whole truth and then what tell it in love like Jesus and everything, like Christ and everything. The Christians are known for using truth as a club. Beat people over the head with hatred almost. The Bible says, and you're going to go to hell. And, and you beat people over the head with truth. Listen, always handle the truth with love. We can't handle the truth with love. There's an Arab proverb that says, when you shoot an arrow, dip it in honey first. I love that. If you want to help somebody change for the better, tell them the truth, but do it always in love. Here, here's how you do it. Tell them the why of the what that you're telling them, right? Say, this is why I'm about to share this with you. I've had to have had many hard conversations with people through the years. And I always begin by telling them why. I'm not doing this to condemn you. I'm not doing this to judge you. I'm not doing this to hurt you. I'm doing this because I love you. And he, I want the best for you. When you share the why behind the what, they're able to receive it a lot better. Show them that your motivation is love for them. Why do we need to approach it this way? Let me tell you why. Because sometimes the truth hurts. Can I get an amen? amen. The truth hurts. But guess what? So does surgery. And there are some things that we will never be healed of without the pain of surgery. Proverbs 27 says, the wounds from a sincere friend are better than many kisses from an enemy. A real friend is someone that can tell you the truth. That you can trust to tell you the truth even when it hurts because they love you. So you tell the truth lovingly. Now, in order for us to do that, it requires us to think before we speak. Think before we speak. So let me close by sharing an acrostic I came across in my studies and then we're going to pray. It's based on five questions that you ask yourself before you speak out. T-H-I-N-K. T is, is it true? Is it true? If it's not true, don't open your mouth. Don't join the devil in lying. Secondly, will it help? Will it help? If I answer this or if I say this, is it going to help somebody or is it going to tear somebody down? Ephesians says, anything that comes out of your mouth should be to build up and not to tear down. I, is it inspiring? Will it inspire them to become more like Christ? Will it inspire them to change for the good? Will it inspire them for, to, for, for their betterment? And is it necessary? Do I really need to say this? Is it going to help? Is it going to inspire? Is it, is it true? Do I really need to say this? You know what? If I don't have to say it, then don't say it. And then K is, is it kind? Here's, here's the bottom line. Love is kind. Love is kind. Love is gentle. Love always seeks the betterment of the other person, not your own. 